I'm thankful for this uh, privilege of being asked to say th these few words. I believe that one of the important traits or characteristics of greatness is the ability of any person who, although she or he holds certain strong beliefs, can still undergo transformation and change and have new commitments when confronted with the truth. Truth and facts do not necessarily change people. Many times, fear of losing friends, fear of losing a job or promotion, or even the threat of being harmed physically, as well as many other reasons, include even sheer stubbornness can prevent some from change. Many people do not have the courage to change. I have been privileged to meet patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, moderators, professors, as well as pastors and many other people during my ministry. I've tried many times to sit with the archbishops and bishops and patriarchs and explain to them about the situation back home. Many times I took them around and showed them, but many of them were not willing even after coming and seeing for themselves, they were unwilling to change. Some have changed, have been transformed, and they became fellow travelers with us on the sabil, on the way of justice and peace. These people have enriched us by their insights, by their theology, by their politics, their dedication and commitment, their faith and their faithfulness. It has been a privilege to come to know these people as we traveled together. On top of the list, stands for me, Dr. Rosemary Ruther. I remember when she came to Tantur in Jerusalem. Kathy Bergen, a friend of mine, a Mennonite from Canada, but working in the United States, came and she said, Dr. Rosemary is going to be in town. She's going to be speak, speaking at the Tantur. Let's go hear her. And we went together. Rosemary gave a good lecture, but hardly mentioned the Palestinians. I looked at Kathy Bergen and expressed my frustration. I basically said, I'm surprised how this well-known scholar has been able to see the injustice done against Jews and the sin of anti-Semitism, but is unable to see the sin of the illegal Israeli occupation and the oppression of the Israeli government to the Palestinian people. Kathy and I went and met Dr. Ruther. I still remember when Kathy looked at Rosemary and she said, do you have a few free time, some free time that I can take you and show you around? That was what happened. She took her around Jerusalem and other places and showed her what was happening. Dr. Ruther 
had already years before written the book Faith and Fratricide, and she was loved and praised for it by many people, including many within the Jewish community. Kathy exposed Dr. Ruther to the other side of the story, the Palestinian side. With courage and determination, that transformation took place, and Rosemary became a strong advocate for justice and peace for the Palestinians. The next book she wrote, The Wrath of Jonah, on the inside page, Dr. Ruther dedicated the book to Kathy Bergen. Rosemary has never wavered in her commitment to justice for the Palestinians. She has been a good friend, a person who gave us much encouragement and support for many years. When I was preparing these notes, I went back and read the introduction which she wrote to my first book, Justice and Only Justice, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation. I felt what she wrote was as fresh as, it were, as if it were written for these days. Her perception and analysis of the situation is as relevant today as it was then. It was not only that she grasped the truth, the truth grasped and gripped her. I would like us to honor Rosemary tonight, a liberation theologian, a scholar who believes that justice and truth trump popularity and fame, a person of integrity, a person of great courage, Brothers and sisters, it is my great privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Rosemary Radford Ruther. Thank you very much, Naeem. And hello, everybody. <laughs> I am enjoying my brief return to Gary, but also impressed by how beautifully it continues to develop. My talk for tonight uh, as you know, it's entitled Ecofeminist Theology and the Challenge of Globalization. Ecofeminism, uh, ecofeminist theology brings together three concerns. Uh, concerns for ecology, for feminism, and for global justice. And I will particularly focus on issues of racism and uh, on the Palestinian issue in terms of these subjects. Uh, this theology uh, seeks to discern the interconnections between the oppressions of human, oppression of humans uh, in terms of gender, class, and race and the degradation of the environment. It also, of course, seeks to glimpse a new theology and ethic that will overcome the patterns of domination in the patriarchal cultures that have been hurtful to both humans and to the earth, and to foster healing relationships between men and women, uh, between elites and subjugated people and our relationship to nature. I, you can hear me in the back? How does it sound? 
Okay? Okay. Among ecofeminists, this connection uh, between the domination of humans and the domination of nature is generally made on two interconnected levels, the cultural symbolic level and the socioeconomic level. Starting with the cultural symbolic level, one looks at the way in which patriarchal cultures have been defined uh, and have defined subjugated groups as being, quote, closer to nature, uh, as being on the nature side of a culture-nature hierarchy. In terms of gender, of course, this means the way uh, women have been identified with the body, uh, with the earth, with sexuality, with flesh in its mortality, uh, its presumed weakness and, of course, sin proneness, vis-a-vis -vis the construction of masculinity as identified with spirit, mind, and sovereign power. The second level of ecofeminist analysis goes beneath this uh, cultural symbolic level and explores the socioeconomic underpinnings uh, of this ideology of women's similarity to non-human nature. How has the domination of women's bodies and women's work uh, by ruling class men been interconnected concretely with the exploitation of land, uh, water, and animals? How have women as a gender group been colonized by patriarchy as a legal, economic, social, and political system? How has this colonization of women's bodies and women's work, how has this functioned as the invisible and unrecognized substructure for the extraction of natural resources for the enrichment of the male ruling class? How does this positioning of women as the caretakers of children, the gatherers of plants, the weavers, the cooks, the cleaners, the waste managers <laughs> uh, for men in the family, how has this functioned uh, to inferiorize this kind of work and also to identify women uh, with the non-human world that is also then inferiorized? Now, this kind of ecofeminist analysis reveals the way uh, that the cultural and symbolic patterns by which women uh, and other subjugated groups and nature are all inferiorized and identified with each other uh, in, in a way that functions um, as the ideological superstructure by which uh, the economic, social, uh, and legal domination of women, uh, land, and also animals, how all of this is justified and made to appear, of course, natural uh, and inevitable within a total patriarchal cosmovision. Uh, elite males, uh, in different ways, in different cultures, create hierarchies over the subjugated humans uh, and non-humans uh, men over women, whites over blacks, ruling uh, class over slaves, uh, and serfs and workers. Now these structures of domination uh, between humans mediate the domination of elite males over non-human nature. Uh, and women were traditionally subjugated uh, to confine them uh, to the labor of reproduction, uh, child care, reproductive work, uh, the kind of work that turns the raw materials of production, <coughs> um, reproduction, uh, child care, and productive work, how this is turned, uh, turns the raw materials of nature into consumer goods. 
while themselves being denied education, culture, control of property, and political power of the ruling group. And of course, whose rules are then identified with human transcendence over nature. Now what this means is that women's inferiorization to men is modeled after the inferiorization of non-human nature uh, to, quote, man, and vice versa. And the term man, of course, functions then as an androcentric false generic, which actually meals, means uh, the elite male as the normative human being, with women, slaves, peoples of other races and cultures seen as lesser humans or subhumans standing between mind and body, human and animal. <clears throat> uh, and this, of course, is the way in which good old Aristotle, <laughs> our <clears throat> friend Aristotle in his politics, understands the relationship between elite Greek males and women slaves and what he calls barbarians. All of which for him are, quote, natural slaves. Now this interconnection between the subjugation of women and that of subjugated races and classes means that ecofeminism cannot treat women as if they were a univocal category. Women are a gender group within every race and class, and this means they share in the privileges or disprivileges of their class <clears throat> and race while being inferiorized as women in relationship uh, to the men of their class and race. But this disprivileging of women, <clears throat> this disprivileging of women um, uh, in relationship to men of their class and race obviously takes different forms in different classes and races. Uh, and so, for example, um, women of the uh, 19th century Boston Brahmins uh, were expected to supervise uh, female and sometimes male servants who might be Irish or black, while themselves often not being allowed to pursue higher education at Yale or Harvard or to aspire to a career in business, politics, or the church. Now these women servants or slaves um, experience much more oppressive lives uh, uh, themselves, uh, but since uh, the women of the elite were themselves their most immediate oppressors, it was very rather difficult uh, for black or working class women to see themselves as sharing a common oppression with white elite women. Uh, so shall we say it takes a bit of perspective to recognize that all of these women, as well as the male servants and workers, were a part ultimately of one, principle, one system uh, designed to place different groups uh, in different roles across class and race for the benefit of one master group, namely that of the elite white male. Now I think that people today are perhaps unaccustomed to this kind of ecofeminist analysis may be inclined to dismiss this as perhaps exaggerated or passe uh, at they, as they look at the way in which women of elite classes and races have in fact now won their way into the privileges of their brothers. Uh, and in the United States, um, uh, these daughters and sisters of elite men, uh, and perhaps some not so elite men, uh, now themselves can go to Harvard or Yale or other elite schools uh, and aspire to uh, careers in business, the church, and politics, although they are still a small minority uh, in these careers. But I think that far from making ecofeminist analysis uh, irrelevant, 
Uh, what this shows is, in fact, the complexity. The complexity of gender within class and race. Um, and I think this reveals why ecofeminist uh, analysis must interconnect uh, with the movements of environmental racism and eco-justice and situate itself in the global context. Now, by environmental racism, I basically mean those movements uh, among uh, African American and indigenous people that are struggling uh, against toxic dumping and environmental pollution uh, that uh, arise particularly where poor people, uh, poor people of color are living. Uh, and global ecofeminism shows how these patterns of impoverishment of nature and the uh, immiseration of humans are in fact interconnected uh, in a worldwide economic system which is skewed for the benefit of the rich uh, beneficiaries of the market economy. When, wherever and whenever gender is analyzed across class and race worldwide, the reality that poor, poor people and particularly poor women of color uh, are the poorest of the poor becomes evident. Uh, some years ago, I read an essay uh, on women in relationship to world population uh, analysis, uh, and this really made very clear the impoverishment of these poor women of color. About two-thirds uh, of the world's 900 million illiterate people are female. In 22 African nations and nine Asian nations, the school enrollment for, for girls is less than 80% that of boys. Only 52% of girls stay in school past the fourth grade, uh, and about four women uh, in 1,000 make it to the high school uh, level. So this gives you uh, some sense of that kind of impoverishment. In addition to that, there is physical abuse, uh, and this uh, really shadows the lives of women, uh, beginning with birth, or for, you might even say before birth. Um, Sex-selected uh, abortions, uh, female infanticide, malnutrition, abuse of female children, all of these are common in many nations. Uh, in India, dowry murders, that is to say the killing of wives uh, in order to seek dowries from a second wife. Uh, this continues to happen despite more than 30 years of efforts to expose this practice. Uh, incest, uh, female genital cutting, denial of medical care, uh, early marriage, forced prostitution, uh, forced labor, all of these hang over uh, women's heads uh, worldwide. Girls and women are more likely to be sold into slavery than uh, young males, uh, and uh, some 130 million women worldwide have experienced the cutting of their genitals, a practice which continues at the rate of some 2 million a year. Now, those concerns with both population and environment have recognized that the um, single factor most likely to check population expansion and to improve the health and welfare of children uh, in families uh, and care for the environment uh, is, in fact, the promotion of equality of women with men. Americans are likely uh, to assume um, that women and children share in the affluence or poverty pretty much on the same level uh, with the men of their family. But in fact, studies have shown uh, that men tend to use, um, this isn't true of everybody, but they, there's an overall tendency uh, to use the majority of their assets for themselves <laughs> and not for not equally shared 
with the women and children of their families, while women tend to devote the vast majority of the fruits of their labor to the feeding, clothing, and educating of their children. Um, women uh, also do much of the subsistent labor that protects and renews local environments. In other words, uh, what this means is the increasing of women's share in education, uh, income, and power is really a major factor in improving the health, welfare, and education of children. Now, I want to be very clear um, that promoting women's equality, in my view, is not a matter of separating women from men or from children. Uh, but rather, its purpose is to convert the relationship of women and men into a greater partnership, uh, a greater partnership and a sharing, a more equal sharing uh, in care for uh, households and children. I think that feminism has been misconstrued, sometimes by feminists themselves, in terms of women gaining rights uh, and access to the same alienated and dominating roles and power as men uh, and sharing the same uh, fiction of individualism. But I believe that feminism should be about converting the patterns of patriarchal domination for both women and men into a new relationship of mutuality. And not only is this not anti-family, but in fact, families, and particularly children, are the first beneficiaries of a restoration of men uh, to caring relations and mutual relationship with women and children. Now, I, will, uh, I want to discuss a couple of examples uh, where this kind of uh, work is going on. Uh, and one of them, which is very important to me, uh, is the foundational work of Maria Mies and Vandana Shiva, uh, expressed in their joint volume, Ecofeminism, which was first published in 1993. Uh, Maria Mies is a, is a German-born um, social critic uh, who has been long involved uh, in movements in both Europe and in India, uh, interconnecting the critique of patriarchy, world poverty, and environment at a global level, while Vandana Shiva, of course, is an Indian uh, critic of science uh, who directs the research foundation uh, for science, technology, and natural resources. Uh, in India, and, and uh, her first book um, uh, what, on ecofeminism, um, which is still widely read, uh, is titled Staying Alive. Staying Alive, Women, Ecology, and uh, Development, first published in 1989. Now, in their joint work, Ecofeminism, Mies and Shiva engage in a critique of patriarchal ideologies enshrined in both Western science uh, and the, quote, development establishment. Uh, and they reveal in concrete detail how the policies promoted by the ideology of the ideologies of these institutions are, in fact, impoverishing uh, the planet and the majority of its people uh, with women and children as the primary victims. Uh, and here, ecofeminist critique and activism uh, stand in a direct relationship uh, to the issues of globalization. Now, in addition to this work uh, by Shiva uh, and Mies, uh, African women are also developing a strong concern for ecology in the context of their native uh, traditions. Uh, and in my book, uh, Women Healing Earth, 
Third World Women on Ecology, Feminism, and Religion, I discussed the views of several African women on ecology. Uh, one of these is Denise Ackerman, a white uh, Christian feminist uh, theologian, um, and Tahira Joyner, who is a Muslim scholar uh, who worked together uh, on these issues in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and there are several other important African women that I discuss in that book in terms of these issues. But for me, actually, the most uh, moving and significant work uh, in uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa is, was actually done by a man rather than a woman, uh, and that is uh, Martinez Daniel. Uh, Martinez Daniel, a scholar of um, African indigenous churches uh, who has helped to develop the Association of African Earthkeeping Churches. Uh, and this work has been extended uh, from uh, Zimbabwe into South Africa uh, and brings together a New Testament vision of the body of Christ, of the body of Christ that, in which all things hold together in nature and in society. And he, he tries to bring that Christian vision into a relationship uh, to the Shona, or African belief, that the ancestors become spirits of the land that protect the land and punish those who violate it. And the African earthkeeping churches essentially have developed a liturgical practice of earth keeping or earth planting Eucharist, uh, in which the community confess their uh, sins uh, in exploiting the land and express their repentance uh, by fanning out, shall we say, to plant trees uh, and clean water resources uh, and thereby to sustain. Uh, uh, foster sustainable agriculture. So that work by Martinez Daniel has been very uh, moving for me. Uh, now I, I want to turn now uh, to another area, the area of our conference here, um, uh, to, uh, na namely to uh, Israel and Palestine, and particularly Palestine, uh, where um, uh, the interconnection of uh, ecological uh, devastation and injustice has been a central concern. Um, Palestine, of course, is situated at the interconnection of three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it has a rich and diverse topography with a variety of flora and fauna. The first domesticated plants and animals of the world uh, emerged in human development in this area of what was called the Fertile Crescent. However, in the 20th century, Palestine has been colonized by Zionism, um, uh, and with that, we have the, the whole history of convincing many Jews to come to Palestine to settle uh, and thereby to drive out uh, the indigenous Palestinian people. Uh, now what in fact happened uh, with that uh, is also that Zionism has not only created the social injustice, but in the context of this social injustice, environmental uh, catastrophe. Uh, and uh, very destructive changes of, uh, in population. Nearly six million Jews uh, came to settle in the area, while some seven million Palestinians were driven out and many made refugees. Uh, in 1948, 78% of Palestine was taken over by the Jewish state, and in 67, uh, the rest of Palestine incorporated into the state. 
Now, the appropriation of this land for a Jewish state has had devastating environmental uh, effects. Uh, there has been an increase in annual temperature, increased by several degrees, while annual rainfall has decreased. And it's expected uh, that this decrease in rainfall may in fact hit 25% uh, in the coming decades. And population has escalated uh, in some areas. This appears to be <laughs> falling away here. <laughs> Um, population, as I said, has escalated, and from uh, 1960 to 2013, in the Bethlehem area, uh, the Palestinian population um, has increased from 90,000 to 205,000, and the Jewish settlers have then added another 80,000. Uh, and at the same time, the indigenous animals and plants and birds have fallen off by about 50%. Now these drastic effects of increasing population and falling uh, water resources uh, have of course been even more acute in the Gaza region. The population of Gaza is expected to hit more than 2 million uh, by 2020. Uh, with more than half of them uh, refugees from the 1948 uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, making for a population density of about 60,000 people, uh, uh, persons per square mile. And more than half of this population is presently food insecure and water is becoming increasingly scarce. Uh, the political siege imposed by Israel exacerbates these environmental and economic crises, for example, uh, forbidding uh, Gazans from fishing beyond the limited area of, of the ocean, uh, and environmental and social devastation thereby is looming on the horizon for Gaza as well as for much of the West Bank. So those are just a few quick remarks on the situation of environment and injustice uh, in Palestine. And I, by the way, I want to say I'm indebted to uh, some excellent articles on this uh, from Mazim Quincia, who has an environmental uh, justice center at Bethlehem University uh, in uh, Bethlehem, Palestine. To sum up then, there's, there is an emerging worldwide ecological and economic crisis of survival uh, around the world, which is forcing many societies to re-examine how religious cultures have reinforced the domination of elite humans over the rest of humanity and over nature. Christians, Muslims, Jews, and Buddhists, and others are presently rethinking their inherited religious traditions to mandate more egalitarian and more mutual relationships between the humans, uh, human elites and subjugated humans, and between humans and nature. Uh, in the Christian tradition, this rethinking uh, is taking the form of uh, some very key revisions uh, in religious symbolism. And so I want to turn now at the close of this talk to look at how theology is being rethought in the context of social and environmental crises. Uh, one might start with the way in which humans have thought about themselves. <laughs> in other words, how have humans uh, seen the relationship uh, between mind and body, uh, between human intelligence and nature. Uh, mind or consciousness, of course, does not originate in the stars, as Plato thought, 
are, and it is not infused into our body by a transcendent God outside the universe, uh, but ra rather human consciousness, in, in my view, uh, human consciousness is an intensification, an intensification of interactive, interactive awareness that exists to some degree on every level of reality, from subatomic sub physics to organic molecules to photosynthesizing plants to increasingly aware and communicating animals. So we might think of our particular gift, our human gift of symbol making, consciousness, as the way in which the earth becomes aware of itself in a newly self-reflective way. And this does not separate us from other species, uh, but calls us to be the place or a place uh, where the cosmic process is celebrated. And of course, we also need to use our intelligence to harmonize uh, our human needs with the needs of the rest of the Earth community. Now, this kind of reintegration of mind and body, consciousness and nature, I think must also reshape our image of, of God. God, in patriarchal thought, has been modeled after the alienated elite male identified mind, which has been thought of as somehow prior uh, to the body, existing in an unoriginated, disembodied mental realm outside of and ruling over the physical cosmos. But in ecofeminist theology, God is seen as existing in, through, and under the cosmic process. And in this perspective, God is neither exclusively male nor anthrop uh, anthropomorphic, but rather God is a font from which the great variety of plants and animals well up in every generation, and the matrix that sustains and renews life-giving interdependency. Now, Christians often get very nervous when there seems to be any uh, critique of uh, transcendence or any notion of God as, quote, purely imminent. This is thought of as a very bad thing uh, to do. Uh, but I think that we need to rethink the concept of transcendence. In other words, the idea of transcendence has to stop being thought of as some kind of dualism between the here and some very far away place outside of the cosmos. Um, this is a dualism that very easily aligns itself with the dualism of mind and body and male and female uh, and, and racial dualisms and tends to identify God with a split off elite male ir uh, rationality while femaleness and lower races are identified with mindless matter. And this is not a transcendent God, actually, uh, but it is really the apex of a system, a hierarchical system of, of domination and control. Uh, and this kind of God uh, is, in fact, a captive um, to the justification of patriarchal domination. So I think we should, uh, we should think of transcendence or divine transcendence, not in terms of this kind of dualism, but rather as a radical freedom of the spirit, a radical freedom of the spirit from all rationalization of injustice, while at the same time being closer to us than we are to ourselves. In other words, God is neither uh, the uh, imminent foundations uh, of the present system of power, nor is God a, a kind of split off mind uh, separated from embodied existence. But rather we should think of God as the material spiritual power 
for the renewal of life that is radically free from all systems of domination and their ideological justifications. God is the creative energy that continually liberates us from these systems and ideology and restores us to mutually enhancing life. An ecofeminist understanding of God both grounds daily life processes and also promotes the creative transformation by which we free ourselves <clears throat> from the distortions uh, of, of the system and rediscover the nexus of right relationships. I think the ecofeminist uh, Ecofeminists must also rethink the categories of good and evil, and mortality and immortality. In my view, evil is not some kind of bad stuff uh, that is located in our bodies, uh, our passions, our sexuality, over against mind or soul as naturally immortal and akin to God. But rather, evil is the distortion of relationships, the distortion of relationships between mind and body, between men and women, between humans and humans, across cultures and races. Uh, and these distortions turn difference, they turn difference into relationships of domination and subordination. Creating systems of power by which one side sucks the life from the other side, becoming rich and powerful while reducing the other side to impoverished dependency. So goodness or salvation in ecofeminism is the transformation, um, a transformative conversion uh, by which these kinds of distortions are overcome uh, and uh, life-giving uh, mutuality is restored. So we need to really relate to ourselves and to one another uh, in such a way that each side can enhance the life of the other rather than one side enriching itself at the expense of the other side. Ecofeminism does not posit uh, some original uh, immortality at the beginning of creative uh, uh, work or creation, uh, nor does it look um, to immortal life as the redemptive future which has escaped from the conditions of finitude. Uh, but rather, I think ecofeminism focuses more uh, on an effort um, or, or it sees this kind of effort to escape from our finite limits as part of the system of distortion uh, by which humans uh, seek to secure themselves uh, and escape uh, into eternal life at the expense of other humans and the rest of nature. So I think we need to kind of dismantle or at least uh, turn away from this emphasis um, on immortality, uh, we need to dismantle the system of distortion uh, that gives the privileged class uh, overweening wealth and power at the expense of other humans and is destroying the life-giving balances of the earth. And in so doing, we do not expect a paradise freed from tragedy and from death, but rather we hope to glimpse a community of mutual life in which we can hold one another in a loving embrace, uh, in the celebrative as well as the tragic uh, moments of our common life as earth creatures. So these are a few uh, tentative conversions uh, of the dualistic way we have symbolized mind and body, God and nature, good and evil, mortal and immortal. Uh, and I think we need to, um, to look at this as a way of 
freeing ourselves from the cultural rationalizations of alienation and domination. But I think that in order for this kind of symbolic transformation uh, to bear fruit, uh, they have to be incarnated into a new social system, a new social system that can relate men and women, races and ethnic groups uh, together into uh, social systems uh, in which everybody can enjoy adequate means of life uh, and the land, air, and soil uh, of the world free itself from the toxic poisons uh, that are um, uh, undermining uh, earthly life. And I think that this will involve new technologies that draw on sustainable energy sources uh, rather than fossil fuels. Um, um, uh, and uh, the way in which these fossil fuels uh, are really undermining the life system of the planet. Uh, but the technological aspects of this kind of environmental sustainability have to be integrated uh, in the struggle for justice. Uh, justice between humans and between humans and other Earth creatures. Shall we say we need to develop new households, new households that model just and sustainable relationships between humans, men and women, uh, races, and the natural world. And these household communities need to be attractive models of sustainable technology, harmonized social relationships, and celebrative culture. And we need to shape these households, not to withdraw into them, but rather as kind of the base, or the basis for networking an alternative economy and society to reshape the larger global systems for a sustainable Earth community. And this struggle to reshape the death systems, that's what I call the death systems of our world, uh, this struggle cannot uh, flow only from anger and fear and guilt. I mean, there might be a place for a little anger, fear, and guilt, <laughs> but uh, it can't flow only from that. Uh, but I think it must be deeply grounded in joy. Uh, joy in the goodness of life and gratitude for its gracious vitality. And so it is to glimpse this uh, uh, this uh, hope, this uh, uh, possibility of health and joy that is, in my view, our basic task as ecofeminist practical theologians. Thank you. Well, that was vintage Rosemary Ruther. <laughs> I first met Rosemary in 1972, so I've known her over 40 years, although she didn't know me. I was a lowly ad undergraduate at Florida State University, and they brought in all the great young theologians. And I have to tell you that my male professors had some negative things to say about Rosemary, <laughs> some of which I did not understand at the time. But I was amazed to see her and welcome her. And then at Mary Knoll, where I had founded a Center for Justice and Peace, a colleague suggested that I invite Rosemary to speak at my summer session, and I said, 
No way, she doesn't know who I am, she would never come. I invited her, got a letter a few days later, and she had read my first book, A Year at the Catholic Worker, which I'll come back to in a moment, and she came. And it was quite an experience, and from then on I realized that we could attract people like Rosemary from all over the world. And of course, in the late 80, 1980s and 1990s, Rosemary and I and Naeem used to travel the world, quite a crew, on the question of Israel-Palestine. And I have many Rosemary stories. During those years, I've met all the great theologians Gustavo Gutierrez, James Cohn, all of them close up because I was director of the center. They didn't know me, but I watched them. And I have to say, there is no one among them like Rosemary Radford Ruther. All of them are great. All of them have something important to say, but Rosemary was the most consistent, the most humble, the most sharing, the most modeling, of any theologian I have ever met. And as a Jew, I have never met another Christian theologian who has been able to hold a love for Jewish and the Jewish people and a love for Palestine and the Palestinian people together, like Rosemary Radford Ruther. Against anti-Semitism, totally. Against our oppression of the Palestinian people, totally. And as a Jew in deep and probably permanent exile, I always remember that of Rosemary Radford Ruther. I want to close with a comparison, which I've thought about often, and I'll make tonight. I still refer to my professors as Dr. So-and-so, and yes, okay, and I know Rosemary was not my teacher originally. But I want to go back to the time when I first met Dorothy Day. Some of you may know of her. Radical Catholic woman from the 1930s on, and I spent a year living at the Catholic Worker, and I tried to call her Miss Day, and you know, forget it. She wouldn't hear it. You had to call her Dorothy. And yes, Dorothy Day once kissed me on the lips, chaste. <laughs> That's how she kissed. A great woman. And by the way, she was a take no prisoners woman. She wasn't lovely and cuddly. She was an icon. And when people would come around the Catholic worker in the 1970s when I knew her, they worshiped her, which she hated. But when I think of Dorothy, I think of another woman whose first name says it all because everybody knows when you say Rosemary, you mean Rosemary Radford Ruther. And as a Catholic, I have known two Catholic women in that category, Dorothy Day and Rosemary Radford Ruther. <laughs> 